That's all. Anup, you can go ahead and uh, get get sir into this. Yes, yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV in this Young Surgeons Forum on Arthroplasty. With us, we have two conveners, Dr. Anup Daman Gaukar and Dr. Jay Shah, to introduce today's topics and the presenter and our mentor. I hand over to Dr. Anup Daman Gaukar. Uh, good evening, colleagues and friends. Uh, uh, it is really our pleasure and privilege to have uh, the, the pioneers of uh, joint replacement a leading surgeon who requires no introduction, Dr. Arun Mulladi, sir. Uh, currently, he's he's spec to be uh, the surgeon doing maximum number of unis. And uh, who else but him to speak on this very, very uh, upcoming, a uh, little bit controversial, but yes, uh, a very much in thing in joint replacement that is unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. And uh, I, I invite Dr. Mulladi, sir, to share his screen and uh, we would love to hear from him. All over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you again for inviting me to this uh, Young Surgeons Forum. So I presume I'm a young surgeon, right? Uh, is a forum of young surgeons, or I'm I'm the young surgeon here who's conducting this forum. For anyway, I'll, take the, I'll take it as the former here. So thanks, thanks for making me young again and putting me in contact with all these young guys. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, unicompartmental surgery today, and we know that this is the most controversial operation, perhaps in in uh, especially in arthroplasty, if not in orthopedics. And it's a globally less favored procedure with a very small percentage of people doing this compared to total knees. And perhaps slightly more common in Europe than in the US. Uh, and it evokes opposite emotions among surgeons. Some people are all gung-ho about it and some say I hate the stuff. And uh, just look forward to finding a uni to convert to a total knee. Uh, so really there are three very important keys uh, in this, this uh, in this surgery one is selecting the right patient second is a, using the right technique and uh, the optimum implant so you realize that the common factor that exists between these three things is the use of the brain and intellect for which typically orthopedic surgeons are not renowned and therefore, I guess unis are not as popular because it involves a lot of thinking and analyzing. And it's not just banging in a nail uh, without too much of thought about it. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why uh, it's not been as popular as it might have been. So, for example, we have our panelists and we have, I think, four or five surgeons on the panel here. How many of y'all only do total knees? So, and not any of these uh, other compartmental surgeries. Any any responses? So Anup. Yeah, me just just started doing uh, uni. So. So mainly totals, Jay. Yes, yeah, so mainly totals. Uh, and the other three, I presume, are doing some amount of. Uh, Dr. Patel, Adarsh, and Dr. Goel are doing some. Are doing yeah. a substantial number yes, of units, yes, I presume. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes, sir. So, yeah. uh, what about patellofemoral? Any of you guys do patellofemoral? Mm, no, uh, sir. No, sir. No, we don't. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Just me. No. So that actually is one of my favorite surgeries, patellofemoral arthroplasty. And um, I, I happen to be a designer for one of the companies uh, overseas where we were designing a PFJ implant as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's it, the operation is even more difficult than a uni in terms of choice of patient, etc. And uh, I think in terms of lateral uni, <clears throat> I have very little experience of lateral unis. So our essential thrust today will be on medial unis. So I believe Dr. Uh, Patil is going to speak on lateral unis. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. So, do you want to actually talk about lateral unis now or at the end? What would you prefer? At the end, sir. Let okay. you finish first. All right. So then we'll go ahead. So we'll try and cover this uh, in the next forty-five minutes to fifty minutes, if possible, and we'll try and include uh, the two cases that uh, our two other young surgeons have today. So we'll try and cover all these various headings. So let's start off with uh, indications, um, age, gender, BMI, PFJ, ACL, and activity level. So these are some of the important issues when you think about which person with, and I'm talking about medial OA here, uh, would be indicated uh, in terms of age, gender, etc. So now supposing you saw somebody at age 45 with this x-ray, uh, completely correcting with a valgus uh, stress x-ray, with a valgus stress, the PFJ looks pretty good and the alignment itself looks pretty good on the left side. Uh, it's bone on bone contact actually in both the knees. So this is age 45. So I mean one could debate whether this should have a high tibial osteotomy or uh, uni. Assuming he's exhausted all options, um, you could perhaps consider a uni in this case or a high tibial osteotomy. Uh, at the age of 55, you'd probably inch closer towards a uni. Um, that's what I would do. Uh, at age 65, perhaps the same. And uh, even at age 80, I, if the patient was age 80 with these x-rays, I would still do a uni. So basically what I'm trying to drive at is that age alone should not matter. And you can see this uh, a gradual rise because I haven't updated this slide, but a gradual rise in the last few years, even uh, in younger patients, in terms of the numbers of unis being performed. And certainly, I have a fairly large number of people who are in their mid to late 40s, and many, many in their 50s uh, who have complete bone on bone contact and are fairly miserable. They have tried everything. And these are patients just because they are young, I would not deny them a uni. Uh, I have very little experience with HDOs. So if you're good at doing HDOs, by all means, you could consider an HDO. So what about the older patients? Now, this is something which a lot of people find surprising that, oh my, an older person, why would you do a uni? Well, uh, there have been several papers looking at unis in the elderly. And in fact, they have a comparable reoperation rate, revision rate and complication rates as, um, you know, total knee replacement. So I would probably say it might be better um, to do a uni in an older person. In fact, we've done quite a few of these patients in the 80s, above even 90s, we've done just about a month ago, we did a 92 year old person. And um, he actually insisted on the surgery that I am quite miserable um, and I need it done. So he had multiple comorbidities. So everyone was aghast that we were doing a uni and yet two days later, he walks out of the hospital. Um, so 80 and above also can be considered if they fulfill the criteria of medial OA. So the most important thing is to determine whether the wear pattern exists, uh, extends to the posterior half of the medial tibial plateau or not. So if it does, then we would do a, a uni. And that typically correlates with the ACL uh, integrity. So if the ACL is uh, intact, then you will find that the wear pattern extends only to the front half or maximum two thirds of the medial plateau. The moment it goes to the posterior third, you can rest assured even if the ACL looks intact, it will not be intact. So generally I consider an intact ACL a prerequisite. Uh, 
And this is a slide from the Oxford group where they showed that the survival rate decreases if the ACL is absent. Uh, you can see the green line and if the ACL was intact, they have a much better survivorship. That's the top flat line. But this was actually for bi-compartmental unis. This was not for uni-compartmental unis, but that, that is a separate issue. Uh, we also studied this many years ago, the cruciate ligaments in arthritic knees, and we published this in the Journal of Arthroplasty. It was histology and immunohistochemistry of the ligaments. And basically we found that as the deformity progresses beyond 10 degrees, you start getting these microscopic and structural changes uh, in, in the ligaments, both ACL and PCL. And therefore, generally the recommendation is beyond 10 degrees, you can uh, you should try and avoid uh, perhaps doing a uni. Another very controversial part in indications is BMI. So whether you should do uh, uni in, in, in these type of obese patients. Well, in the Oxford group, uh, they say that there is no contraindication for uh, BMI being on the higher side, but perhaps for a fixed pairing, uh, it is recommended that you should not uh, do it in patient person with a very high BMI. The other controversial issue about indication is how much wear should you accept in the patellofemoral joint. So this again remains an area of controversy. The general recommendation is if the medial facet of the patella is damaged, you can accept it. But if the lateral facet of the patella is damaged down to bone, then perhaps a total knee would be indicated. Uh, especially if on the trochlea as well, you're down to bone. So if you have a kissing lesion which is down to bone both on the patella and the femur on the trochlea, then perhaps it's not a good idea to do a medial uni. You could do a bicompartmental as we've done in uh, some cases, but otherwise you should convert to a total knee. Now this is a very good paper which uh, I would suggest you should all read. They looked at a thousand knees and uh, they looked at Cozin and Scott contraindications for doing a uni, which I, you should be familiar with, that they suggested don't do unis under the age of 60 if the weight is more than 80 kg, if the patient has a high activity level, if there's chondrocalcinosis and exposed bone in the PFJ. So they had noted all these variables in their series where they had done uh, mobile bearing unis and they compared those patients who had a uni with these and without these contraindications and the American Knee Society scores showed no difference up to 10 years. So at 10 year follow up you can see there was no difference in the scores uh, whether you followed Cozin and Scott criteria or you didn't follow them. And in fact, the Oxford knee scores were slightly better uh, with, when you did not obey the contraindications of Cozin and Scott, which just goes to show that perhaps uh, these don't really matter and were not very relevant, possibly for the mobile bearing type of unis, because this study was restricted to mobile bearings. So here you can see now the 15 year survivorship of this same cohort uh, with and without the contraindications, you can see that if there were contraindications, in fact, your survivorship was better. So that's about uh, indications. So at this point, if anyone has any specific points, any any uh, queries, uh, please stop me. Otherwise, we'll move to the technique. I just wanted to add, sir, if you don't mind. So I, I absolutely agree with uh, Arun sir about the age. Uh, is, is so right sir, there's no age cutoff at all. In fact, we are taking all our patients in a bimodal age group, younger age group. They're getting a, a good, I mean, a joint with a good function for like at least 15, 20 years. And the older age group with much less, uh, more, much less morbidity and pain and they're also very, very happy. So absolutely right there sir, I, I would agree with that as well. 
Okay. Sir, in the in the pre-operative workup, uh, are we through with that, or would we have a session uh, or a talk on that later on as well? So, would you always do a stress X-ray? Would you always do a um, an MRI with cartilage mapping? Will you? What would be your standpoint of uh, a pre-operative workup? I think the most important pre-operative workup is examination, clinical examination of the knee. Uh, firstly, to ascertain from the patient whether their main pain is medial or not. If they start indicating the whole leg, the calf, the thigh, etc., then this guy needs to be uh, looked at more carefully. But most of these guys will indicate to you, my pain is here and they'll point to the medial joint line. So that's the first and most important clue. The second is, that you've already seen the x-ray it's pure bone on bone contact if you do not have bone on bone contact and the patient may cry and wince and say that they are miserable with pain if they don't have bone on con bone contact i will not operate on them with a barge pole for sure because if they don't have bone on bone contact they do not have pain coming from the knee joint it is from elsewhere and most likely it's going to be either um, in their uh, in their brain some problem there or in the spine but most unlikely that they'll have any issue with the knee and if you do a uni or a total knee with intact cartilage they will make your life miserable after surgery so that's very important um, so that second thing is this uh, is, is the x-ray bone on bone contact but make sure it's a weight bearing x-ray if in doubt do a PA view with the knee slightly flexed you can do that third is when you examine the patient and give a valgus stress you should find in about 10 to 15 degrees of flexion when you give a valgus stress you will find that the alignment improves and you can move it back into a more neutral position this, to my mind, is the key uh, to your examination. The other thing is, then you will wear a stress again in 15 degrees of flexion. And when you do that, you see how much it's opening up on the lateral side. Some of our patients are extremely lax on the lateral side. And these are the patients where if you do a mobile bearing, you might come to grief because they're very lax. So in these patients, I might consider a fixed bearing knee. Your MRI will only be confirmatory because sometimes you will not be able to pick up on x-rays and skyline views, some involvement um, of the, on the lateral side, on the lateral facet of the patella. Sometimes we get caught out in the lateral PFJ. So if that's bone on bone contact, um, then I would go by the MRI and not advise them a uni. So that's my workup. Valgus stress x-rays each time to see for lateral compartment cartilage? No. Firstly, there's too many variables in getting that x-ray done. Right. Uh, you have to teach people how to do it, how to hold it. If they don't put it in flexion and do it in extension, you're not going to get any opening. Uh, it's all, uh, you know, and then they rotate the leg while doing it. So it's a big mess. So if you've got a good x-ray department, uh, because a lot of our patients will come, you advise them a stress x-ray and they go somewhere and get it done from any radiologist next to their uh, place of residence uh, and you'll get some shabby report, which will only mislead you. So if you're, if you have a, in your own hospital clinic, or center if you have trained people doing it that's fine but all you're going to see is whether it's correcting or not highly unlikely that the lateral compartment will be involved so that's really a figment of imagination that you're looking for where on the lateral side most of these people when they're worn out medially are not going to have much wear on the lateral side so that's not what you're really looking for you're looking for correctability and that you can determine your, clinically. Sir, and, uh, what is your take on the you know osteophytes in anterior medial osteo uh, anterior medial OA? In on the lateral side, it might be on the patellofemoral side. 
totally irrelevant. Doesn't matter at all. And there are enough studies which show there's no correlation um, with this, and uh, it doesn't matter. Osteophytes uh, do not signify, uh, they are part of the osteoarthritic process, and therefore you'll see some osteophytes on, uh, on the lateral side in the patella. But as long as the cartilage is intact, uh, I wouldn't worry about them. Virus correctable from 10 degrees to 7 degrees or 5 degrees. Would you still go ahead? It's not less than three for sure. Uh, Partly correctable virus. That is again very unusual. Either it doesn't correct at all, or you'll get it correcting completely. If it's right. Right. Uh, something in between, means uh, um, there is something going Watch on over here. You need to recheck. But generally, if it corrects, it'll correct completely. Right. Or right. if you find that it's not correcting completely and you feel that it's still in residual varus, then this person may have an extra articular deformity and that's why it's looking still in varus. So then you should do your imaging and do long leg films uh, to see what's happening, whether you have an extra articular deformity. But the chances of it uh, correcting partly are very minimal. It, it's either not correcting at all, okay. it's a degree or two that's not correcting. So by correcting, we mean you can get it back to almost its normal pre-arthritic condition. Hey, Dr. Adash, tell me. Yeah, uh, Arun sir, do you, you did mention that uh, obesity is not a contraindication. So would you go for any BMI you don't mind offering the uni if there's AMOA? Yeah, currently, uh, the, the only time I don't do a uni in a very young person, uh, you know, if they're very obese, then I hold that as a, um, I blackmail them with that. And I tell them that you have to lose weight, then only I'll do this, otherwise you're going to have a problem. Okay. Because I don't want to operate on a young person and do a uni when they have a BMI of 40. Right. Uh, you know, a 40 year old. Today I saw one lady who was 42, 42 I think. And a BMI must be around 38, 40. So, absolute perfect indication for a medial uni but i said if i do a uni there's no way she's going to lose weight uh, she'll be only too happy with the pain relief and go about her merry way so so i told her you get your weight down and then come and do it so i try and blackmail them into losing weight if okay. they are young the elderly people are not going to lose weight uh, they're not going to change their lifestyle. But for the younger person, I always try and educate them and tell them that, look, your lifestyle needs to be changed. Uh, I can do this small job for you and fix it, but you have a bigger problem which needs to be tackled. So deal with that first. Because this is an easy solution, but it's, it's you know, I use the opportunity to threaten them to improve their lifestyle. Okay. Thank you, sir. Do you do for elderly patients? What? Okay, for elderly patients uh, who looks a bit on you know osteoporotic or you know osteopenic on you do you do any special you know uh, test or you do correct the osteopenia first and then go for the uni? I personally have not seen uh, the tibia, certainly not the femur, the tibia settling down or becoming loose uh, in elderly or osteoporotic patients. That may happen if you resected too much bone or uh, and you've gone down too far into soft bone on the tibia or if you put it in valgus because then your the, the lateral part of your tray is um, going down into the center of the tibia, which is soft bone. So if you put it in valgus, you might have a problem. Valgus tibial tray. Uh, okay. Or if you undersized it. So if, if you've subs, you know, substantially undersized your tibia and moved it laterally and you don't have medial support, then there's a possibility that you'll come to grief. So if you're fairly good with your technique, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the obesity. But maybe if you're starting off, it's a good idea not to tackle these type of cases because 
uh, you don't want to do them on very obese patients and very challenging cases just to start off with. And as you acquire more uh, experience, you can then keep doing more and more of these. Yeah, I think we can go on, sir. So, in terms of technique, uh, I use a tourniquet for all my cases. Um, tranexamic acid. Uh, position for unis is this hanging leg position. But when I'm doing a fixed bearing, it's standard like a total knee. Now, in terms of gap balancing versus measured dissection, these are the same controversies that come up as in total knee replacement. Uh, the only advantage here is that hopefully you're not correcting a big deformity and therefore you're not doing any releases. So really speaking, what you're doing is a measured resection most of the times. The only thing you need to make sure is that your gaps are balanced and that you don't want, especially if you're doing a mobile bearing, then gap balancing becomes the mode of uh, balancing. Whereas if you're doing a fixed bearing, measured resection is uh, perhaps more appropriate. How do you achieve this? You can use conventional instruments, PSI, navigation, or a robot. So what about PSI for unis? Does anyone use PSI? No, sir. Yeah, so I think that's a, uh, it's been shown that it doesn't have any functional benefit. Um, does not really do anything in terms of cost or timing or anything of that sort. Uh, so I think these have been given up in terms of PSI. Although I think a few guys did uh, publish, I think th this group from uh, the UK did publish that um, early outcomes were better using PSI, but not very convincing. So now the question is robots. I think a lot of people use robots nowadays. I think uh, this was this in the last three or four years, the situation has changed quite dramatically from maybe a isolated use to a fairly widespread use of robots for, for this surgery. And uh, some of the results, this is the two year results which showed uh, survivorship and patient satisfaction of a robotic assisted medial uni was pretty good. Um, this is the overall survivorship at two years in some 900 unis. Uh, they showed there's improved accuracy of component positioning with, you, with a robot which I think would be uh, easy to understand and expect that if you use navigation or robots, you will get improved accuracy. So the implantation error still exists, however, even with robotic, you can get some errors, but these were shown to be slightly more with uh, when you did not use a robot in terms of the tibial component, femoral component in the axial plane and so on. So the red bars are the non-robotic ones uh, in terms of error rates. Uh, the errors, of course, are not that huge, but as, uh, as you can see, the differences are not that great. Zero to two, for example, in the tibial component, the axial plane. Now the question really is, more importantly, whether this is for a fixed bearing or a mobile bearing. So this two and three degrees don't matter too much if you're using mobile bearing because it's part of a sphere. So it's a hemispherical femur on a hemispherical tibial insert, which is again moving on a flat surface. So almost 10, five to 10 degrees of positioning error in the femur is permissible as also on the tibia. Uh, the only thing you have to be very careful is the posterior slope of the tibia in a mobile bearing because then your flexion gap will either be too tight or too loose. Uh, so I guess it's it's not that critical in a mobile bearing. It might be more critical if you're using fixed bearing and then therefore uh, any form of navigation or robot may be useful if you're a fixed bearing person. But this is a key question and this has been answered that does it really matter at five years 
using a robot versus conventional uh, unis. So this is a five-year clinical outcome of a randomized controlled trial. Uh, five years down the line, excellent outcomes in both groups. No statistical or clinical differences in the patient reported outcome measures. So this is perhaps a, a very key paper because this is the one which is a randomized study. It's five years and it's got the two arms perfectly matched and they clearly show that it doesn't matter clinically. The only thing is that there was a lower reintervention rate at five years for the robotic arm assisted uni when compared with a manual approach. So that was perhaps the only uh, downside of conventional surgery. Otherwise, the results were no different. So which brings up the point about you know the additional cost and investment that goes with a ro with a robot, uh, and there are a whole load of issues which can be debated, and we've had debates on this in the past. Uh, so this issue will probably be resolved as more and more papers come out, either showing that it matters or it doesn't matter. So at this point, we had some point about technique, right? We have some case for uh, discussion of technique. Or should yes, I just go ahead and we'll come to that in a moment when we talk about the surgical technique as such. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Divyanshu. Uh, we can take it at the time of the surgical technique time. Okay, all right. Yeah, that will make okay. more sense. Yes. So now in a uni, like in a total knee, we are aiming for 180 degrees, generally speaking, unless you're into all these fancy kinematic alignment and restricted kinematic alignment. But generally, you want a straight leg for a total knee. But in a uni, it's slightly different. You're not aiming to bring it to exactly 180 degrees, but you're trying to leave the patient in their pre-arthritic alignment. So it is really the precursor of kinematic alignment. It actually took birth because of unis. Stephen Howell actually got the concept of kinematic alignment from unis. Um, so uni is typically kinematic alignment. You're trying to put it back where it used to be before there was arthritic change. And we've studied this and published on alignment and its determinants uh, after Oxford Uni. Generally speaking, we tend to leave them in about two, three degrees of varus or even more. It's a fairly wide range uh, post-operatively uh, because this is more determined by their pre-op deformity. So the severity of the pre-op deformity will determine the post-operative alignment. So you can see almost a straight line correlation uh, between the two. So which also brings us to the point that if you have a very large pre-op deformity, remember they may remain in some degree of possibly unacceptable residual varus. So if you are... Uh, if you promise the patient that I'll correct your knee deformity, then you might be in for trouble because if the patient started off with 165, uh, the amount of correction achieved will be more, but they will still remain in a, res a substantial amount of residual varus. So you've got to be aware of that. And the other issue is at the other extreme, that if you have a patient with a minimal deformity, minimal deformity like, for example, in this, uh, in the right knee, which is five degrees of varus, but confirmed bone on bone contact, these are the patients where you've got to be very careful that you don't overcorrect them. So this patient has been overcorrected. Uh, so when you have a minimal deformity, you've got to be very careful that you don't overdo it. So we published this recently in uh, in the Acta Orthopedica, um, not recently, it's almost five years now, where we looked at patients where they had an unaffected opposite leg, and we had done a uni in one on one side, and when we compared their alignment, their joint line obliquity, the weight bearing axis vis-a-vis. White side, uh, not white sides, the Kennedy white zones. And we found that actually the alignment is restored to that of the unaffected contralateral limb. So if you uh, do not do any release, 
just excise the osteophytes and balance your knee to what is a natural uh, to their natural alignment then this will be almost comparable to their unaffected in other words their original native alignment gets restored so this was one of our studies that we showed that now in terms of implant choices uh, there are a variety of decisions you have to make cemented or cementless or hybrid I think in our country we still haven't got cementless but uh, that's only a matter of time before it shows up I don't know if any of you are using cementless or it's all cemented all cemented all, all cemented, cemented. Yeah. all cemented and then you have the option of a fixed bearing or a mobile bearing uni uh, then in the fixed bearing you can have modular monoblock or all poly uh, implants I've used all of these we used to get the monoblock um, um, unis from Sulza they were pretty good um, most of them are modular and I've also used the all poly preservation unis uh, we'll talk about the selection of these and the results a little later I also do some bi compartmentals I haven't done any bi unis because I don't think that you can get medial and lateral compartmental OA uh, with an intact ACL it's most unlikely it's only people who don't understand the pathology of uh, arthritis who think that a bi uni should be done I don't think there's any indication for a bi uni because the moment the ACL the, the lateral compartment gets involved only when the ACL is deficient and in that case you are not going to do a uni so the question of a bi uni is just a theoretical point which probably some engineers have thought of and some surgeons without knowledge of pathology now fixed bearing or mobile bearing so thin point has published this which shows a higher forgotten joint score for fixed bearing than for mobile bearing unis uh, in terms of all polio metal back we have seen that uh, in a randomized trial of all poly and metal back um, you see the survivorship of all poly is extremely low almost 50 percent as compared to mobile bearing so stay away from all poly tibias I use I've done maybe about 20 of these preservation all polys uh, we've had to revise one of them the others seem to have done reasonably well but still it doesn't seem to be a good idea given this data cementless UKs are doing very well especially the cementless Oxford uh, um, unis are doing extremely well and they have a fabulous survivorship uh, the only risk is in a cementless one you tend to hammer it in a little more firmly and therefore you might risk fractures and a lot of these fractures have been seen in the Japanese uh, population because a they are small patients small sizes and then you try and vigorously impact a cementless uh, tibia into these um, you might have a problem so uh, shall we go on to the surgical technique and then maybe we can talk about the question that somebody had yes sir yes, yes, yes. Okay. so this was a surgery that was done uh, and recorded uh, this is a fixed bearing uni uh, in a 73 year old male we did a bilateral uh, uni these are the x-rays so we do it under tourniquet this is a supine position uh, standard incision medial parapatella and no release has to be performed whatsoever except just enough to excise the osteophyte and uh, and then excise the meniscus once your tibial cut has been performed so you are taking off the osteophyte on the medial side the osteophytes in the notch are very important you have got to make sure you take these off without damaging the ACL or the PCL similarly the anvil osteophyte is important and then the medial osteophytes 
need to be taken off. So these are all the standard steps. That's so the only release and that's the surface of the patella. So you can see it's a pristine patella, pristine trochlea and lateral compartment and uh, the trochlea is perfect. You can see the ACL and then with uh, a hook we are testing the stability. So when we navigate we use the pins within the wound for the femur and for the tibial array it's lower down and then do a standard registration of the center of the femur, the white sides line, medial lateral epicondyle, anterior cortex and then the medial and lateral malleoli, tibial axis, AP axis, medial tibial plateau and this gives us a reasonable idea of the alignment. Here it's 10 degrees, 2 degrees of flexion and it corrects to about 4 degrees with the valgus stress. So we are happy to leave that finally in around 3 to 4 degrees of valgus. It flexes to 125. So I'm just showing you both conventional and navigated. So in conventional surgery you'll use a, a standard jig. You don't want to resect too much of bone, just enough so that the thinnest insert along with the tray can fit in comfortably. So here we are trying to demonstrate both. So we are pinning it in and then we will verify with navigation. This cut is the most important and you just go uh, medial to the ACL and then you check the resected segment, measure it with your lollipops, excise the medial meniscus and then check your flexion gap. Once you check your flexion gap, you can size it as well. So you know the appropriate size. And then you place it in extension. So you mark your anterior most position. And now you check your alignment and your extension gap. So here we navigate and we are seeing now with uh, the appropriate spacer, we are getting it to about 3.5 degrees, which looks good. So at that point, we resect the distal femur. So that's a jig used to resect the distal femur. Once that is done, you then size the femur. And this allows you to perform the remaining cuts. So in this particular system, you do your posterior cut, your chamfer cut, drill two peg holes, and then you use a gouge for the anterior part of the femoral flange, the curved part. So that's your femur prepared. Here's a trial going in place. This is again an animation to show the same steps. So now we've checked our alignment, we are happy with the alignment, stability, nice and stable in flexion. At this point we'll prepare the tibia, so this is the tibial preparation for the keel. the keel punch and then the drill hole for the peg. This again demonstrates the same steps. Once this is done, it's a matter of drilling a few holes into the sclerotic bone and then cementing first the tibia. Tibial tray goes in, impact it.
and then the femoral component. So we apply cement on both surfaces, the bone and the implant, and then allow it to set in about 45 degrees of flexion or an extension depending on what your preference is. And then we check everything at the end of the procedure. So we are happy with the alignment stability. So we'll select the appropriate final insert which is snapped in place. We release the tourniquet catch bleeders. We like a little bit of play in extension, but nice and snug in flexion. Full extension is possible as well as full flexion. These are the post-op x-rays. We did the other side uh, thereafter. And next morning, this is the patient and the movements. Okay, um, which then brings us to results. So before that, I think uh, one of you all would like to share screen and show some technical uh, case regarding the technique. So I'll just stop sharing here. And, again, uh, sure. You can ask questions in the meantime while the next person shares the screen. Sir, in any eventuality, did you have to uh, assess on table that the ACL is lax and you need to do a total knee instead of a UK? Yeah, we've had that happen about five or six times. So it's about, um, yeah, it, it happens every once in a while. Generally, most of these have been assessed very carefully beforehand, but sometimes uh, you don't realize on the MRI that there has been significant you know, wear of the patella. So the last one was about a week or ten, about a week ago, where when we opened up, we found that the lateral facet and the trochlea were both fairly substantially involved. So we decided to do a total knee. So if you're doing a fixed bearing, it doesn't matter because the patient is in any case in a supine position. In the Oxford Uni, it becomes a problem because it's a, a hanging leg position. So we actually went ahead and did a total knee in the hanging leg position. Um, there are some surgeons who do it in a hanging leg position. And uh, uh, Peter Bonuti is the guy who actually mentioned about doing it in the hanging leg position, a total knee. So we went ahead and did it in the hanging leg position and actually worked out beautiful because the flexion gap balancing <laughs> is absolutely brilliant in the hanging leg position. Uh, you need to have a low uh, trolley on which you can rest the foot while you're performing you know the tibial cut and so on and we navigated it uh, and did our totally navigate it so that was even a little bit of a challenge but we did it in the hanging leg position and when you're doing the femoral cut, you need to lower the table. Um, yes. But otherwise, it, it was it was fairly doable. So now we're not even worried about converting from a hanging leg to a supine. We don't even waste that time. We just go ahead. Just get a second trolley, which is fairly low down, on which you can rest the foot, the, the, the foot so that you can stabilize it for performing your tibial cut, registration, etc. But your flexion gap yeah, balancing is so beautiful, um, this is unbelievable. Right. So when would you do a mobile versus a fixed bearing? So generally speaking, I would do a fixed bearing if there is a considerable lateral laxity, uh, if the patient is very elderly, low demand. If I'm a little concerned about, you know, the alignment. Uh, and I want to be very careful that I'm getting my alignment perfect, then I'll navigate into a fixed bearing. When I'm worried that, you know, I might overdo it, put it in valgus, uh, or if I'm unsure whether I'll be able to correct the deformity, then in all these I'll do a fixed bearing. For younger patients, I tend to do a mobile bearing. 
more um, more active people i do a mobile bearing what would you say is more forgiving i mean this is a very uh, uh, dogmatic question uh, as regards uh, your tibial tray placement um, and the tibial slope i for, for actually, people to start neither off is, neither is forgiving i mean That's right. it is a demanding surgery and i think every i won't even say a millimeter matter that in some instances even half a millimeter can be a problem you know it can create trouble so it's a great deal of accuracy that you need while doing this surgery so i would say if you're doing it's as forgiving i think a fixed bearing as a mobile bearing um because one may be in the short term and one may be forgiving in the long term so for example what i mean by that is if you get your balancing act wrong your meniscus will dislocate and that will happen in the short term if you malposition your tibial tray for example in a fixed bearing in the long term you are going to have more wear so neither is really very forgiving i think right yeah doctor anush yeah uh, arun sir do you use uh, multiple different companies in your fixed bearing or you use any single one no because i have only uh, you know my navigation software okay. works with uh, one particular design so i use only a fixed bearing of a particular one okay sir it's compatible with that um that's that's really the short answer to it got gotcha. you got gotcha. Do you usually take a very liberal incision to check the patella under surface in every patient, or you just evaluate it preoperatively and then you take a call? You don't need to take a liberal incision just to see the patella. I mean, it's very easy. You extend the knee and evert the patella. That's enough. You don't have to do a lot. Okay. Because the incision. P F J. We are not doing too much. We don't do a full medial para patella even for a P F J arthroplasty. Right. Yeah, Doctor Divyansh, I think you can start off, and we'll have uh, questions coming on, off and on. Yeah, a question to Doctor uh, Mulla Ji, uh, sir, how far you go in uh, quadriceps? Like you know, uh, the hanging knee technique, that instrumentation, we can you know uh, save some quadriceps from cutting, as compared to the uh, T care position, you know, implants instruments. What do you say in this? Yeah. so i i personally don't think it makes too much of a difference because in terms of recovery uh, our total knees with a complete medial para patella incision seem to be doing as well <clears throat> as the knees so i think it's not terribly relevant if you go a few millimeters more proximal or not i don't think it seems to matter too much i think the key of course is adequate pain control and your soft tissue balancing if it's reasonably good um whether it's a total knee or uni should not be too different so go ahead with this what are you showing us bilateral medial compartment oa correcting on valgus stress with a reasonable patellofemoral joint no osteophytes or probably 7 to 10 degrees of varus patella osteophytes pfj you comment on that sir yeah i i not comment on the osteophytes the osteophytes be present because this patient has osteoarthritis the question is is there cartilage pain yeah yeah if there's intact cartilage on the patella and on the trochlea especially on the lateral facet i'm not fussed now there may be a difference if you're doing a fixed bearing because fixed bearings perhaps have a slightly higher rate of anterior knee pain uh, overall in the registry data and therefore you have to be a little more careful uh, with the patellofemoral joint in fixed bearings some are in mobile bearings there's a slight difference because it's a round on round it's it's a spherical femoral component and you leave a ridge of the native uh surface of the medial femoral condyle the anterior part intact so the patella glides off that and then makes contact lower down 
if you don't get your fixed bearing component, the anterior flange nice and flush with the cartilage, then you're likely to have a bump. And if you already have medial OA, then that's going to get worse. This is just uh, my conjecture, but the results do seem to indicate that in terms of anterior knee pain, perhaps the mobile bearing is more forgiving. Yeah, Dr. Divyanshu, can you continue? Are you on? What's happening? You've seen the x-rays now. What's what's next? Is there a question? Discussion? Yeah, I think he has joined. Divyanshu, you can continue. You need to tell him to unmute himself. Divyanshu, can you unmute and go on? Yeah, this was a straightforward uh, medial compartment OA. Uh, we had planned for an Oxford uh, uni for this patient. And uh, there's certain uh, routine uh, tibial biscuits as well as uh, routine surgical procedure went off. But what we found intraop was that the extension was a little on a tighter side. And then eventually on the X-ray also we found uh, there was a medial osteophyte, which I was worried about in the initially post-op period. And then in the long-term follow-up, patient didn't have any issues. Now she's three years post-op without any uh, symptoms of any kind and no complications. Okay. And similar medial osteophyte I found in another patient of mine. She was absolutely fine. These are our post-op results. And another patient, we had a medial osteophyte, but again, no symptoms. I was always stressing about a lot about these medial osteophytes being left behind, but I was always worried about doing any excessive release in order to expose them and maybe causing MCL to become a little lax. So my question to you, sir, is, is it forgiving that we leave these osteophytes or do we really go dig in for them? Uh, I tend to remove them. I, I try and feel the periphery and uh, check the medial side of the tibia and use a very fine ronger and trim them off. Uh, I don't see a problem in creating any instability really. Right. Sir. But it just looks neater on the x-ray as well. Definitely. You don't see those osteophytes. Yes. And so maybe, do you think, I don't know, in some of the earlier ones, I don't know whether your resection was adequate or uh, or not. Because most of these osteophytes would come out if you've taken off a reasonable amount of bone. Uh, if, if your cut is in perhaps a little bit of valgus relatively, uh, you would be leaving a little bit of the osteophyte. So maybe on the right side, I don't know if the tibial cut is perhaps slightly in valgus. So the medial side is a little more proximal than it should be. And if you keep it maybe in a degree or so of varus, you might actually be removing those osteophytes. Right. Because the uh, right side, my uh, bearing was three and the left side, it was four. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to say. And also there's a slight lateral tilt, a valgus tilt of your tibial tray, possibly. Uh, uh, it's 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 not a dead uh, AP. Uh, so I can't the right be sure. AP raised by the technicians. Yeah. So maybe that might you know if it's a degree or two of varus, it doesn't matter in Oxford, and that will get you to remove the osteophyte as well. Right. So with these, uh, so, um, like in this case, uh, it's about three years down the line, and uh, uh, patient seems to be doing well. Would you foresee any problems in the future with uh, if you you know if you left a small piece on the median side of the more osteophyte, maybe at five years, ten years, do you think that uh, you know the median side is tighter and can and can cause more problems down the line? I mean, if the patients have no complaint at that, I mean, the post-op period, highly unlikely that this will start manifesting later. So, if the patient's doing well, I just Ignore all that. 
because osteophy themselves i don't think cause pain and if they are natural if it's a piece of cement over there then yes that's going to be dangerous but if it's an osteophy it may not matter and i just put in a ronger and just take it off cementophytes also you tend to remove at the end of surgery would you check immediately like a cement oh yeah yeah you have to take off cement you can't leave behind cement the tips for common question the tips for removal of posterior uh, tibial tray cement uh, how would you cement uh, your your implant in so the first thing is uh, make sure that you got good visibility right through the back so that's why i use a tourniquet in totally i don't but in unis i would because i want to see the back so your blood pressure hemostasis uh, your visibility etc should be pretty good right at the back i put cement on both sides but you got to be a little more judicious in how much cement you apply don't apply a thick layer of cement uh apply it and then take it off uh especially towards the posterior rim you should not have any cement on the bone similarly on the implant i keep a little maybe a millimeter less than the posterior rim and then when i impact it i make sure i go posterior first and then anterior last so as it uh it's being impacted the cement is driven forwards and not backwards so that's that's important and then you should have nice instruments to go around and feel the back uh to take them off now in a mobile bearing it's a flat surface so it's pretty easy to do that but in a fixed bearing where you have a wall uh that's going to be a problem because behind that you probably have some cement um uh, so you got to have a nice instrument like a mixer an angled uh Uh, instrument to get the cement out of the back. Right. Uh, your any experience of posterior blow out of the tibia while preparing preparation of the tibia, and how do you tackle that? Yeah. So, if you are using uh, any device with a keel, so one is the keel preparation can create a problem, and the second is your AP cut. uh when you're doing your vertical cut for the tibia you got to make sure that you're not going past into the cortex too far posteriorly and inferiorly because then you are damaging the posterior cortex so you got to make sure that the angle of your saw blade is perfect of course in robotic surgery probably doesn't matter because the robot's going to make sure that you don't do all of this but if you're doing conventional surgery you got to make sure that your saw blade angle is parallel to your tray and if you tilt it downwards that's when you'll have a problem so and similarly when you are pre- preparing your keel you got to make sure you don't go too far posteriorly so that can happen in an oxford preparation because when you are doing the oxford keel you need the bone pick and when you are impacting the bone pick if you use a little too much of force it will go and hit the posterior cortex so in an oxford uni you've got to be a little more careful <coughs> so how do you tackle that so you go ahead with the once you once you fractured the... it once you fractured it uh, you are in deep trouble if you can bail out into a totally it's better because most likely that's going to fracture and create a problem So if it's a very minor crack and you have noticed it, that's fine. But if you haven't noticed it and you pick it up later on, then you might keep this patient non-weight bearing for quite some time. Let it heal. Explain to them that the bone is not good quality and you don't want them to weight bear. So let it heal. So if you not while impacting shattered it further, uh, then you might get away with with it healing. but if the person starts walking on that then i think you are going to be in trouble and if it's a real bad blow out then you'll have to bail out another uh, you know practical uh, question uh, the trial poly especially with the uh, uh, mobile bearing uh, 
uh, that plastic and that metal you know most of the time it is not uh, sometimes you know the the metal part comes out then how do you you know get that poly out that that becomes a tough job not final poly the trial poly with the final implants uh are you talking about a fixed bearing i i no, have not a mobile it. bearing in a mobile bearing uh, what is not coming yeah, the mobile bearing we had done the final implantation uh, the femur is done the tibia is done and we are doing a, a trial with a trial poly but the metal and the plastic usually that that joint is most of the you know because of you using it repeatedly it is loose and sometimes that metal comes out and the poly remains inside ah oh, okay you mean that it's broken or it's it's damaged the clip, yeah. insert is damaged and it's not gripping it and it doesn't come out you'll have to use a cockers or something or a towel clip give a little valgus give a little valgus stress put a towel clip or a cockers and it should come out It's a tough task to. Sorry. It's a tough task to take that out. Um, I haven't really seen that happen. I mean, we also get some of these broken trials, uh, but <clears throat> it shouldn't be that tough. It means that probably you're too tight in flexion. You haven't resected enough tibia, or you put in too thick an insert. Uh, you need a little bit of play. You cannot have it jammed in. you jammed it in that it can't come out it's it's obviously too tight either you oversize the femur you reduce the tibial slope you put in too thick an insert or you resect it too little of the uh, of the tibia so it's one of these issues or your anesthesia has worn out <laughs> one of these <laughs> because suddenly it become tight and it's not coming out so these are the possibilities for some you, surgeons some surgeons usually trial uh, with with 1 mm uh, higher insert for better cement pressurization because you can't dab it in and then use a final poly which is 1 mm less uh, would you second that or what is your take on yeah, that yeah you yeah you should do that you can do that but uh, a 1 mm difference is not going to make it impossible to remove it cannot no, be that right. tight you give a valgus stress in flexion and it has to come out I don't see why it will not come out. Very difficult. It, it, there has to be some other issue. Yeah, you had a point, Adar. Yeah, I had a question, sir. Actually, uh, you had mentioned that sometimes you do find this tightness because of uh, not enough of resection of the tibia. So when you do have that, do you ever actually increase your tibial cut, or do you try to adjust in the femur? Do you have to recut your tibia ever? Oh yeah, quite often. uh yeah. unlike in the oxford uh, teaching that oh never ever recut the tibia i am not too fast about that it is against the teaching of the oxford group yeah. to not recut the tibia but uh, i do that ever i mean, I, i've had to do that a couple of times i wanted to see if you do it too because as you said they keep saying don't do it so yeah, i, I had to... a big argument with vijay bose in one of the meetings where he said oh never ever Recut and so on. I said it doesn't matter. I've done it for twenty years and I've not seen any problem. Right. Thank you. You got to be careful when you're recutting it. You got to yeah. have good visibility. You got to protect your MCL. You got to be absolutely in firm control of your saw blade. The leg has to be absolutely steady, well well lit, and you know why you're recutting. You either you're changing the slope or whatever. Now of course these shims are there, but yes. that shim is a two mm shim. So suddenly, from three, you go to five. Correct. Yeah. So that becomes a problem. So I don't use the shim because I've taken off one mm too much. So I would do that freehand. Right. But there's nothing stopping you from readjusting your cutting block at a slightly lower level, repinning it, and cutting it properly again. I don't see any problem if you don't want to do it freehand. Yeah. Thank you. so oxford people can be quite dogmatic and you know you can't do this and you can't do that but i think that's for the average general surgeon it's a general point that don't unnecessarily recut because there's so many things you have to take care of when you're recutting so better you avoid it but if you need to 
and your experience i don't think it makes a difference but for teaching purposes yes it makes sense to say uh, don't do it so we can go on uh, and then we'll have dr adarsh coming up um, for his case presentation sure sir okay so i'll go to share screen again so then we are talking about results okay so generally speaking uh, the results of you needs are not as good as total needs we know all that um especially in the first few years there's a higher rate of revision and almost all the registries will show that you needs are not as good as total needs um and this is across you know the swedish registry the national joint registry and more more of course important is that in the younger age group the uh the results are even less satisfactory and you'll have a higher rate of revision so here this is the crr revision rate so you can see the dark gray is in the younger people under 64 and their revision rates are even higher the ones who are older will have a lower revision rate so this is something that the registry data shows um so that as the age decreases the risk also decreases but that's true even for osteoarthritis for uh, rheumatoid and for um total knees as well so even in total knees you'll find that the younger age group has a higher rate of revision only thing is that the actual numbers are slightly different but therefore in younger people you got to be a little more uh, careful with your patients but the big advantage of course is that infection in uni is almost unheard of um i have had one infection in one patient but otherwise i've seen one in another patient done somewhere else but it is extremely extremely low it's less than 0.1% in our series so that's one of the great things about uni versus total knee the other thing is of course in terms of the usage of unis so this is a very good paper which most of you might be aware of 40000 cases from the national joint registry um and they found that if you do too few or you do too many you will have a problem so the optimum number was somewhere around 20 to 50% of your practice uh, of to of knee practice is unis then you will have the lowest revision rates the other uh, issue that people will throw at you are the data from registries and especially those who do total knees will keep harping on the fact that the registry data shows a higher rate of revision so this was a very important paper from new zealand which showed uh that irrespective of the oks the oxford knee score category uh there were more unis being revised for the same oxford score uh so therefore it showed that people were very keen on revising unis compared to total knees so if you have a score less than 20 you will see the number of unis being revised 60% as against 10% of uh, them only being total knees you know the bar on the extreme left so in most cases you will see that for the same score oxford knee score you will see more unis being revised because it's easier to revise a uni so you also got to be aware of the sort of people who are practicing in your town and around you and how pro or anti uni they are the more anti uni they are the more likely they will convert any of your unis complaining of the slightest knee pain so that is a risk that you have to take um doing unis this is another study of patient reported outcomes 14000 matched patients of course these are all oxford uh, um papers from oxford but they have taken data from the national joint registry so it includes uh, totals and unis and you can see and i think most of us know that the results of unis are slightly better than uh, total knee in terms of patient satisfaction 
um, the PROMS favor uni, more highly satisfied patients, more excellent results and so on. So this I think uh, most of us are fairly familiar with that the scores are somewhat better with unis. Um, in terms of artificial, uh, in terms of uh, forgotten knee score, forgotten joint score, again, you can see uh, unis have a slight edge um, on total knees. Likewise, sports, physical activities, 80 to 98 percent can return to their original sports. Participation in sporting activities is better with. Uh, unis as compared to total knees total knees um, you can see the difference so this is basically just suggesting that the results are fairly good we know all that uh, what about revision after total knee and uni compartmental knee arthroplasty so if you've done a total knee and a uh, uni what about the revisions so higher surgeon volume is associated with lower revision rates so we know that as well from the UK data that if you're doing more cases, your revision rates are going to be lower. Uh, here they compared consultants and trainees in this paper where they looked at 1000 patients. And uh, in fact, they did not find any major difference between the two consultants and trainees as well as time since implantation. So the survivorship was more or less the same over a period of time irrespective of whether a junior or a senior guy did it. Now, in terms of technique, we've talked about technique. Now, we had somebody who wanted to bring out a, a, a case with complications. So, before I go further, you want to talk about that? So, I'll okay. stop sharing and uh, you can share your case. Hey, Dr. Adarsh, would you be yes. coming on? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be sharing my screen. So just a question till Dr. Adarsh comes up. If a patient comes up to you for a uni, uni uh, surgery, what would be the, the duration of pain-free uh, joint range of motion that you would advise? As we know, for a total knee, it would be around 20 to 25 years. What would you your claim be? I tell them about 15 years. Because that's the sort of data. 15 to 20 years is what I've seen now. Because we started doing them in 97. So we have a 25 year uh, follow up now. And we are seeing that 20, 25 years also, we are not getting our patients back for revisions. Um, the percentage is extremely low. So I'd say that over 95% would not need a revision for at least 20 years, if not more. Yeah, Dr. Adarsh. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me today. So uh, I'll be discussing a case. Uh, so basically, it's, it's related to obesity. So as uh, Sir had mentioned in his talk, the Cozen and Scott, they say it's a contraindication, but the Oxford team said it's definitely not a contraindication. And even uh, Dr. Arun says that most of his cases, he doesn't mind unless they're a little younger. He may dissuade them and try to ask them to lose weight. So I just wanted to show this is a case that we had done earlier. Pretty uh, overweight lady, very tall very bulky legs and um, one year post-op she was walking really well and uh, her arm is good and she was very very comfortable and she was probably the 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 highest bmi at that time which i had done and then even at the robotic uh, uni uh, there's a he's not very obese but uh, he's a very bulky guy and he had a pretty high bmi and he had a good follow-up as well so we were pretty sure that the oxford team is probably right the obesity really isn't that much of a factor. So then we come to the case that I'm going to be discussing about today. A 73-year-old lady presented to us with a left knee pain, medial aspect tenderness, and all the criteria were met. And uh, so we went ahead with the uni, the surgery went well, and she had very good outcomes one month and uh, one year follow-up as well. She's not extremely obese, but on the higher side of the BMI. She was doing great after a year and she was ready for the right side as well. So again, the criteria were met, the medial compartment OA, the ACL, medium compartment OA, and the pristine lateral compartment. The case went well, is what we thought at least. And uh, post-op, everything looked hunky-dory. And uh, 
we'll come back to this x-ray in a bit. But two weeks post-op, disaster struck. And uh, this is a very scary x-ray that we had to see. And this is the first and only time we had a medial condyle fracture. And uh, so we went back, we had to explore it again. And um, we had to take everything out. And we had to put in a wedge and a plate as well for extra support and convert to a total knee replacement. So first question is, was it my fault? Would like to be... Medial plays, we medialized. Yes. Can cut, vertical tibial cut is not right. Correct, sir. yeah. So I, I would agree. So it is probably my fault. She did give a history of a fall. We don't know whether that would have happened after she fractured or whether the fracture, but definitely, as you said, it looks like the tear is too much medialized. And uh, that's one thing. Second thing, could the vertical cut have been too deep? So uh, for the people watching, this is, you have the risk of a lateral going too laterally in the cut, but that's probably not that much of an issue. But if you go too vertically, as uh, Arun sir had mentioned, if you lift your saw too high up and you end up cutting deeper than what your jig is allowing you, then you're going to have a tremendous stress riser on the medial condyle. And there's a very high chance of fracturing if your patient is even a little bit higher on the BMI scale or even osteoporotic. So um, just any discussion on that, sir? Do you, you think you would want to add to this? Yeah, there's, there's only one other point. Uh, if you go back to your x-ray. Yes, sir. This risk increases if your tray is slightly valgus, which it is. Yes. Yeah. So uh, th this is known to be a greater stress riser if you kept it in a little bit of valgus. Mm -hmm. So then the force goes downwards and is a little more likely to create a fracture. Right, sir. Also, I'm a little unhappy as to why your lateral space is so wide. My worry is that her ACL is not perfect. Okay. Uh, because this is opening up far too much. Um, you right. normally don't see so much of don't see such a joint thing. space. Yeah. This either implies that your ACL is not okay or it was partly affected during the surgery or it was not intact or there is some issue because otherwise it won't open up so much. Right, sir. So to probably too medial, a little bit of valgus, and there's something wrong with the ACL probably, otherwise you won't have such a big gap. Yeah, when you re-explored, would you recall what was the ACL condition? Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't in uh, the city when this happened, so my trauma team had to take it, and I was aghast seeing the X-ray from outside the city, so they had to take care. So I let me see if there's any picture of it in trauma. I don't think there's much visualization of the ACL there. It's all... No, I don't think we can really see it. But yeah, there's definitely something up there. So probably you're right, sir. There could be something wrong with the ACL as well. So going through the literature, there, this is a good paper by uh, Lou et al. And uh, where they've seen the, the, the characteristics of tibial plateau periprosthetic fractures in UK. Um, they found that it's higher in females. Of course, it's going to say that the BMI range is on the higher end, around 32, average of 32. And of course, low BMDs, uh, osteoporotic bones are obviously more uh, prone to having tibial fractures. Uh, again, the causes, they try to enumerate the different types of causes. And uh, the most common, again, is the fatigue resistance because of the and uh, insufficient keel groove preparation is one more. And the Kirshner wire injury in, in the internal cortex. Uh, what are the different treatment protocols? Conservative, I don't think any paper uh, has shown that conservative is giving any good results for a tibial fracture. I don't think we can go ahead with that. Definitely, we need internal fixation. You support it with a plate and some screws, and you're going to have to obviously revise it to a total knee. Most of the papers are showing better results with the revision, and uh, we had to put in a, uh, a wedge as well. So now, actually, after this, I mean, of course, the, the technique also was faulty. But we have also started to reduce our uh, B, uh, cutoff point. So our cutoff for BMI is like anything you know, between 32 to 35. We try not to push for the uni. Thank you. Sir. So do we have time or should we wind up with the lateral uh, uni? We, can go we the have part. time. Uh, one more slides. Okay, we'll just talk a little bit more about complications since uh, we are on that subject. So, I mean, 
these are the typical complications that you will see progression of arthritis, uh, loosening, wear, lysis, bearing dislocation, infection, DVT, P, and mortality. The main cause of failure, what's the main cause? So when they looked at uh, some 400 cases at six year follow up, it was overcorrection and lateral OA. So that is one of the important uh, things to avoid is overcorrection. Poly wear generally does not occur, especially with the newer polys, but it's more likely to occur in a fixed bearing uh, because there's a greater stress concentration. So the von Mises stresses are higher and concentrated um, at the point of contact, whereas they are more divided over a large surface area in a mobile bearing. So you see that the wear is exactly where the wear occurs in, uh, in the native original cartilage to occur at the same point. And the rate of wear is slightly faster with uh, mobile with fixed bearings than with mobile bearings and that's the only reason why I tend to use a fixed bearing in the more elderly low demand group uh, although now the improvement in poly has occurred uh, so therefore these data may change as uh, um, as time goes by so this is a 20 year report of uh, a fixed bearing metal back fixed bearing implant 72% 74% survivorship at 20 years which is not bad and again they found that progression of arthritis and 25% had polythene wear and the mean time for revision was about 13 years so in fixed bearing you can see if you have to give a number then you have to say about 13 13 years is this is the longest study of fixed bearing uh, whereas Oxford you have people up to 20 and 30 years data from uh, some of the Oxford uh, not the Oxford group but uh, from the Swiss group SWAD uh, has 30 year follow up with almost 90% success so where is a concern in the fixed bearing and this this shows up in multiple papers this one had only 86% survivorship at 8 years the MG2 uh, infection we already talked about is extremely uncommon and the graph on the right, the bar on the right shows the orange stuff at the bottom is a very thin line of infection in unis, much more in total knees and these are all uh, not really relevant to us as orthopedic surgeons. The important thing is that the mortality, 3 month and uh, 1 month mortality is lower with uh, unis than with total knees which is again very good because this helps our patients who are elderly more uh, comorbid. So here they've looked at mortality and perioperative complications uh, after unis and generally deaths are very infrequent fortunately but you can have some cardiac issues in this group. Uh, overall the complications are slightly higher with total knees than with unis and we know that. And this is another important paper which is more recent, the five-year outcome, the top catch study, which suggests that both are equally effective, total knee and unis. They offer similar outcomes, similar incidence of reoperations and complications, but lower costs and more cost effectiveness with total uh, with unis during the five-year study period. So this is a more recent paper, but again, it's heavily directed by the Oxford group. Uh, now in terms of revision we've already seen one case uh, results of UK revision versus HTO conversion versus TK revision. So this is the key question right that if you did a uni you did an HTO or you did a total knee. Uh, firstly which revision is easier to perform and secondly what are the success rates for each of these categories and how complex would it be for each of these conversions. So I think uh, it's, it's quite variable depending on how the primary was done, the primary uni, the primary HTO or the primary total knee. If they were done very badly then the complexity will increase when you're converting it to a, uh, or revising it. Um, if the uni was done well then it's a very straightforward conversion.
If the HTO is done well, again, it's a straightforward conversion, except that there may be a lot of metal work to remove plates and screws, and then you have stress risers. And of course, without doubt, a total knee revision would be the most complex. So especially in a younger person, to me, it makes more sense not putting in plates and screws uh, and doing an HTO, but doing a uni because it's far easier to convert a uni to a total knee. And then, uh, I think the total knee would be the most complex to, to revise. So here they've uh, looked at a study of computer assisted total knee after open wedge osteotomy versus uh, after uni. So this is like a failed HTO, right? So whether a revision HTO or UK to a total knee, uh, what are the outcomes? So they found that there's a better functional outcome after HTO conversion. So this is important to remember. And conversion of a uni to a total knee. So this depends on how well or badly it was done. It can be a minimally invasive procedure when revised to another uni or if another uni is added. And very often a uni can be also revised to a primary total knee with primary outcomes. Only in about a third of cases would you require stems and revision components. So it's almost like a primary in most cases. So now this is the case. Uh, this is a uni that we had done and this patient presented almost nine months later with this. Uh, you can see this was many, many years ago. This is a single peg of the Oxford femur femoral component. So this was done uh, a very long time ago. You can see that the tibia has collapsed. She kept walking on it and finally came, I think, after almost nine months. And uh, this was the original x-ray, just to show you. Uh, what the primary was. So you can see that there was no obvious problem with the with the surgery. Um, the immediate post-op x-ray looked very good. There were no cracks or anything and she just surfaced after all this time. And we had to put in a sleeve and stem because it was a huge chunk of bone uh, uh, posterior medially. So we used the sleeve and a stem construct. So I think that is probably it. So we've talked a little bit about the revisions as well. So if there are any other queries, then we can take them. Or uh, meanwhile, we can have our last speaker put up the lateral uni. So we complete the topic. Sir, uh, what's your take on um, bearing dislocations in the mobile bearing uh, unis? What, what's my take in the sense uh, it in can how do you avoid it or you see it uh, how do you avoid it what do you do if it happens so usually uh, it's it's either a surgical issue or it's a traumatic problem if it's related to your technique your gaps were not perfect um, obviously a little too lax it can happen um, if the patient, for example, my very first patient when I had done a uni for, for almost the first 10 years, I never had a bearing dislocation. And my first one occurred almost 10 years later. So in all the Oxford meetings and at CCJR, I said I have never had a bearing dislocation. Uh, and then the first one came and that lady was, was doing yoga and she was doing some crazy position with her knee and it popped. So that was the first time. So quite often it is due to the patient doing something weird. The most recent one we had was a lady who actually has a stroke on that side, on the other side. We did a uni in this and she has a stroke on the other side. So the way in which she was walking, she was tending to put a lot of stress on this, uh, on the uni side. So maybe we should have done a fixed bearing for her. Uh, so maybe it was a wrong indication. You know, the type of uni was incorrect. So if it happens, you've got to try and understand why it's happened. Generally, you have 
it's easy to take it out and you generally put in a 1 mm thicker insert and that takes care of it. I brace them for about 6 weeks and then allow them to start bending the knee and telling them to avoid whatever it was that led to the dislocation. So if they are doing some yoga or something funny, uh, you have to try and tell them to avoid doing it. And I have had one patient where she, uh, one or two patients where recurrent dislocations occurred and we finally converted to a total knee. So how will you address this question of pain post UK? What would be your protocol? Yeah, so especially the proximal tibial plane, uh, especially the proximal tibial, you know, medial side, yeah, medial, medial side condylar pain. pain. So I think this is a discussion you should have the have with the patient well in advance that you know you may get some pain which may persist for six months up to a year. It's very uncommon, but in some people it may occur, and it's just the time it takes for it to adjust to the new weight bearing and the difference perhaps in the uh, modulus of elasticity of the tray compared to the original medial uh, cartilage and medial surface. So there's a higher stress on the medial side of the tibia. <coughs> this has been shown very well by Keith Berend and, and their group, Merrill Ritter's group, that you have a lot of concentration of stress medially on FEA analysis. So that this can cause pain and you've got to tell them that it may take six months or up to a year for that pain to settle down. In that period of time, if they go and see your good friend, your neighboring orthopedic surgeon who doesn't like unis, then you can rest assured it will be converted to a total knee before you can say hi. No. So that's, that's a big risk. Any experience? Sorry? Your any experience in the proximal tibial, sorry, your any experience with the proximal tibial pain with the mobile bearing versus the uh, fixed bearing? Fixed bearing. Good I question. haven't seen it in fixed bearing for some reason. Yeah. Although I haven't done so many fixed bearings as mobile bearing, I've seen it only in a handful of mobile bearings, and possibly I haven't seen enough because the ones who may have got it revised elsewhere don't then show up and, and meet me, so I wouldn't know. But generally speaking, uh, it's not that common to see medial pain, very unlikely. But it can occur and it's a big problem because then you have, it's a matter of how much confidence the patient has and how much faith that patient has in you. Because especially if they, they feel that we should have done a total knee in the first place and you pushed a uni down their throat, they'll keep on and on and on moaning and groaning. So that's that's another factor. Whether they were keen on a uni or you were more keen on a uni. So you've got to be sure that it wasn't you who were forcing a uni down somebody who, want, who knew only about total knees. So that's important. But then they'll keep complaining. So, do you in any patient, patient uh, in which it's indicated to do a uni, but the patient is not agreeing and you end up doing a total? Oh, yeah. Uh, if, if they're not agreeing, there's no question of doing a total knee uh, or doing a uni. a uni. If they're not right. agreeing, they're not agreeing. I mean, I'm not going to force it down their throat. I am not getting any royalties from doing a uni, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So... So, if there is in, in the lack of a situation where there is no bone on bone arthritis, but there is a mid segment uh, full cartilaginous loss and uh, uh, there's no bone on bone arthritis per se, what would be your take uh, in those particular patients, those iffy groups uh, who are right uh, in their 47 to 55 years of age? No, I think HTO. Yeah. yeah, maybe you could consider an HTO because uh, uni is not a good option. But even an HTO, I would investigate them and make sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not too keen on people having even an HTO when there's no bone-on-bone -bone contact. Because uh, it doesn't make too much sense to, to do an HTO if there is intact cartilage. Why would they have that much pain? Explain that to me. Yeah, others. 
Sir, so uh, you do a lot of unis, you know that. So what is your percentage, sir, in your in your practice of unis versus uh, total knee replacements? Uh, I would say it's close to fifty percent. Between forty and fifty percent is what last we had measured or calculated somewhere. But it varies. I mean, suddenly you'll have a crop of all these uh, people with severe tricompartmental arthritis. Then for few weeks, it'll be only total knees. So mm-hmm. over a period of time, it's between forty and fifty percent. Okay. Because we... suddenly we are just seeing valgus knees. Mm-hmm. Suddenly we have this crop of. Horrible valgus knees. I mean, normally you don't see valgus knees. It's very rare. The we cluster phenomenon. A whole huh? load of valgus knees now. Right, sir. Because we we also when we studied our total knee patients, uh, like more than two thousand, we found around forty percent of them could have been amenable for a unis when we just studied the biscuits. So I think uh, you're you, you're actually doing them for all the correct AMOI patients. Yeah, it also depends because what happens is that once you start doing more unis, then you also get more unis. So then your practice may get skewed towards right. more unis. Right, right. Whereas if you're doing more total knees and you know you keep getting referred more total knees, then your your practice will be skewed towards total knees. So I think this this number is not very relevant. Uh, I think the key question is what does that patient need, right. a given patient. uh it's it's okay from the oxford point of view to give some sort of indication because for them it's selling more knees you know you keep saying ha ah, you must do more unis you must do more unis that's great for their business but i mean in terms of uh, surgeons it's not easy for you you know if you do a uni it doesn't do well they go off to your neighbor and he revises it uh it it becomes a big issue right you don't want right. that happening correct Okay. okay, let's have Dr. Patel. I think so. We've talked enough on the medial side. Now let's make a lateral shift to the lateral uni. So you have a few slides, I believe. So go ahead. Yes, Dr. Patel, yeah. go on. Yeah, is it? Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. we can see your slides. Yeah. I can't see my slides. <laughs> sharing is for it's showing can you stop my sharing again and i i'll i'll reshare it again yeah is there any problem from your side not really the first slide had come up uh, some time back now we're not able to see yeah but i can't see my slides that's the problem is your zoom link on uh, just see if if it is minimized or anything is on Can you see now? No. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's sharing something now. Yeah. But uh, 
slides are not visible i don't know if it's visible to the others oh that's visible slides aren't visible yeah we can is it visible now yes yes yeah it is visible yeah but we okay. can see your view I'll... yeah okay sorry i have to you know I... but that's okay that's okay you can go, on. go in the slide uh, shailendra just go in the slide show upar slide show yeah. this is animations ke bajo mein jo hai niche niche all icon on the bottom left also on the, on the, on the right yeah normal side. niche the niche normal view ke bajo mein yeah. ye nahi iske bajo third, third icon third icon on the left yeah 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 this iske baad wala iske baad wala yes. idhar idhar niche niche yes this yes, one sir. yeah yeah that one that one yeah yeah okay yeah uh, thanks dr anup for this opportunity okay just a minute sorry fir se gadbad ho gaya nahi nahi wo can just speak on the same same, uh, same view as well don't worry Okay. I think you can go on on this. Uh, this view. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Anu, for this opportunity. Uh, actually, I, I had prepared a short uh, presentation, but I'll go back to this. As you know, the, it's a very rare, rare thing. I, I was lucky enough to operate on five or six patients on the lateral compartment. The first case was way back in five or six years back. Uh, if you look at ratios it is like total to partial to lateral is almost uh, like 100 as to 10 as to 1 so that's why the the ratio of the surgeries are very less in the this thing looking at the indication is all, all you know uh, as dr arun has said you know almost all are the same as the uh, for anterior medial osteoarthritis and even the contraindications are almost same only the indications increase uh, the it is uh, you can perform in the post traumatic condition cartilage loss or osteochondritis desicans uh, condition like osteochondritis desicans i'll go to the directly to the uh, surgical tips steps uh, either you can do it in hanging knee position if you are trained to do in that position or in ideal tkr position uh, looking at the surgical steps the lat it's a lateral parapatellar incision with the uh, Uh, i'll just uh, make the different points for, as compared to the medial uni uh, okay. you uh, open right. the lateral plate can you see the change of slides i can't see the slide change yeah oh, you're seeing the same slide no. you're seeing the same slide we are only seeing the cover slide we're not seeing the next slides yeah correct now that's it we are no we aren't able to see the slide change Uh-huh. Can you just click on the down arrow and just see how it's going on? Yeah, it's it's it's. it's no, it must be mind. rolling on a screen. No, I, I same the as Dr. Arun is was doing. I was pressing on the you know the forward button. Try clicking the down arrow if it's slight changes. Uh huh. Any change? No, no, no. We can't see that. Can you share it with somebody so that that person can share the? And that's feasible. Yeah. Now. Okay, guys. Do you mind if I take your leave? Uh, I need to really be out of this here. Yeah.
Thank you, sir. I don't have any experience or I can't really contribute to lateral unis. <laughs> you don't mind. Uh, thanks for this uh, good session. Yeah, and uh, you carry on, please. But uh, excuse me if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your Thank you. time. Okay. Take, take care, guys. All the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah, now we can see. Yeah, now we can see the slide. Yeah. Yeah. So either you can do it in the hanging. Yeah, surgical steps. You are seeing the same slide which I am seeing. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay. I think he might not. Okay. So either you can do in a handing knee position or an ideal take care position, whichever you are trained in. Uh, I'll just differentiate between the the. the different points between doing the medial oa and the medial uni and the lateral uni in the, it's a lateral parapatellar incision while going up in the quadriceps you don't come across the tendon but you come across the muscle uh, in the in parapatellar region there is a lot of pad pad which you have to tackle that's compared to the uh, on the medial side and again the lateral uh, uh, sleeve is bit flimsy uh, you know as compared to the medial side Uh, on exposed part lateral condyle looks something like this yeah coming to the tbl cut as you can see in this you know the diagram it is same as uh, you apply the uh, for the medial side it's a perpendicular to the tbl axis but the tbl uh, anterior posterior cut you have to go a bit on the medial end of the lateral tbl plateau which we usually don't Uh, do in the uh, medial uni so and at the same time you are hardly you know uh, if you are measuring with the tibial tuberosity you hardly take 5 or 10% of the tibial tuberosity in uh, calculations so as for the medial side you have to cut minimum 2 to 4 mm uh, another thing is the on the lateral side there is lot of cancellous bone as compared to the medial side there is a cortical bone available on the medial but that's not the case on the lateral side so you have your cut has to be minimum it is perpendicular to the mechanical axis slope depends upon the kind of instrumentation or the implant which you are using and that company is uh, giving you then again uh, you have to re avoid re excessive posterior cut and the one important thing is that you have to internally rotate the tbl component coming to the femoral cut again it depends upon what instrumentation you are using uh, like in if you are using for like johnson and johnson you uh, take the distal femoral cut in the extension uh, parallel to the uh, tbl cut or uh, processes like slade uh, where you have you take a free hand uh, you know you just take a shave of the cartilage with a chisel or a saw and you take a free hand posterior cut so the femoral cut either you can use intramedial or extramedial system you have to maintain the 4 to 6 degrees of valgus alignment the important point here is due to the screw home mechanism of the distal femur in a, uh, full extension the placement of femoral prosthesis has to be lateral as lateral and externally rotated you know as as much as possible and another thing for patellar femoral side you have to undersize the femoral component i'll come to these two points this diagram will make it very clear that this in this this if this looks like a femoral component very well placed in a knee in flexion but if the same knee is goes in extension due to the screw home mechanism this implant is going to impinge on the tbl spine so that's why you have to place it bit laterally not medially and you have to externally rotate the femoral implant so the in extension there is no impingement at the uh, tbl spine uh looking at the patella for lateral unis you have to avoid oversizing to our you know uh, avoid oversizing to avoid the patellar notch scott has already suggested patella is high there is a highly chances of impingement to avoid this residual cartilage should be taken off and the distal condyle and the, uh, from the distal condyle and you have to undersize the component because most of the articulation is on the lateral side in the patella cementing again you know you can have it for tibia first then insert and the femoral component so implant selection for lateral side there is no big uh, there is big no for the mobile bearing because of the inherent lateral laxity fixed bearing implants are 
uh, metal back fixed bearing implants are the choice. Again, uh, they say all poly implants are good, but again, the quality of the bone in our scenario is not that great where we can, you know, dare to put all poly implants. There are no separate uh, prosthesis available. Uh, right medial, you can use it for the left lateral uh, on the TBL side and left medial, you can use it on the right lateral and the femoral component are comes in the right and left side. You know, we are using the same implants for the medial uni. To, so the surgical treats to mimic the lateral compartment kinematics and the screw mechanism. So you have to internally rotate the TBL component by 10 to 15 degrees and you have to avoid the impingement uh, to avoid the impingement. And <clears throat> you have to externally rotate the uh, femoral component and you have to place it laterally. So these are the two tricky points you have to consider. Again, these patients are usually, you know, young patients. I had few, some few patients, which, you know, I'll just share. I'm not going in details. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was 40 year in more foreign patients, you know, who demanded the lateral uni. Uh, the arthritis was due to the post injury. He has got undergone two, three arthroscopic procedures, but he was not uh, this thing. This was done long six, six years back. Uh, that time I had preferred a uni, which was that time Zimmer product, but now it's uh, sold to some other company. Then uh, another case of 42, four year male, old male, uh, meniscectomy, arthroscopic meniscectomy done for a despite meniscus, lateral meniscus, but still patient was unhappy and the constant pain all the time that I was the surgeon and he has not responded to any kind of conservative treatment for at least, you know, two years. And we had done this, uh, I think Johnson & Johnson, uh, Sigma type of, you know, Sigma uni. Uh, another case, you know, a 48 year female cartilage loss after bike injury. Again, I was the first surgeon treated with the arthroscopy and some cartilage transplant uh, procedure. But again, the patient was not happy and uh, constantly complaining of pain. And you can see this, you know, this, this was the cartilage loss and she was complaining of the pain. And this was the final, again, this was the Zimmer Uni, uh, more fixed bearing implant. You can see the, you know, the, the way it, it, though it in flexion, it looks weird, but you have to place really externally rotated to avoid the impingement of in the extension. Thank you. Great, Dr. Patel, very, very nice cases, very challenging as well. Really, really nice, yeah. Thank and you, I Dr. guess uh, there is still scope for yeah. some, some lateral unis as well. Yeah, it's very rare to uh, see a lateral uni. I'm sorry for the traditional teaching <laughs> because uh, there's not even bone on bone, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's why I said you know, in uh, indications, you have two, three extra indications which gives you the this thing cartilage loss, uh, post traumatic uh, injuries, and the uh, uh, osteochondral desiccants or avian like conditions in the. But again, the literature and the, everything is very, very, very few literatures are available for the same. There are only pay, two, three papers by Pennington et al. and the Scott, you know, who talks about the lateral unit. So probably the indications are not going to be the same for the medial, medial UK, right? Like we, I don't think the bone and bone is as important and even probably yeah, ACL. That's not good, yeah. Even probably ACL, am I right? Yeah, ligament for any, any, but I don't know, but for all units, the ligament, all the ligament has to be intact. All the units. There were some uh, some paper about domed unis uh, for for lateral compartment. Away, I, I I don't know what what is the latest on that. Just some read that I had uh, uh, so some papers that I had gone through. Any experience in that domed unis? I had attended a talk. No. Uh, a European surgeon spoke about them, but I haven't seen them. Uh, yeah, right. Presented cool. a few cases on those. Okay. No. Right. Great. Great, great yeah, nice, nice to have you all, Dr. Adarsh and Dr. Shailendra, Thank you, Dr. And Dr. 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 Real, Thank you, real Dr. pleasure Dr. to have you all. It really Thank went on well. Thank you.
Thank you so same much. Same pleasure here. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Thank sure. So hope to catch you all soon. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thanks. Nice catching up. Many years. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Divyansh, I'm going to give you a call back soon. Yeah. Right now, after I log off. Right. Okay. Good night, everyone. Okay. Chalo, good bye. night. Thank everyone. you. Thanks bye. for your time. Bye. Good night.